The whole point, right, is that animals have not evolved to use tools in the way that we have, right? The closest that I've seen is this. This is Suda the elephant. She's been trained to paint self-portraits. That's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, not only that an elephant can paint a self-portrait, but who's the zookeeper that thought, you know what, I think that elephant's got some talent. Whip out the easels, guys. We're going to put this to, to test, right? But the point here is that animals are not as advanced as we are, right? And what separates that technology, animal and human technology, is not so much the fact that we know how to use tools, but it's the fact that we know how to continuously improve our tools. Um, and that's the purpose of my topic and really what has been the focus of, of most of my career. Um, my name is Tom Genitasio. I'm at Atasi on the web. Uh, look me up. I'd love, love to be friends. Um, and I have been obsessed with tools for most of my life. I became obsessed with learning design and development tools back in the early 90s when the web was still young. I eventually went on to publish a good amount of content uh, about using tools, um, it's clickers. <laughs> working for Smashing Magazine. I worked there as an editor for a while on design tools specifically. Um, but it was about seven years ago I started doing some work with Apple uh, and they were building these design environments so that people could design things for their iAd platform and also iBooks and iTunes. And something clicked for me. This was like really compelling to build these tools that other people would use to design other things. That was really fascinating to me. Um, because in a way, I was designing for myself. I eventually went to MIT and I helped them launch an education platform. Um, called edX, and there I was focused on tools for professors, helping them put their courseware online. After that, I founded a company called Macaw, and we built responsive web design software, uh, and a few years back, that was acquired by Envision. I work at Envision now as a, a director of product design, and for the past two years, I've been focused primarily on a tool called Envision Studio, which is a design, prototyping, animation, sort of all-in-one tool. And so the theme throughout my career really has been a focus on tools for creative professionals, uh, the folks who are in this room, basically. And I've learned a few things. One is that you are all very, very opinionated, um, <laughs> which is a great thing, uh, because it's, it's fantastic designing for designers, because chances are they're better designers than you are, and sometimes they'll just design it for you. Right? So the whole thing of like, don't listen to what your users actually tell you they want, it's a little bit different for us. Sometimes they're like, ah, that's better than what we thought of. Right? Um, but the, the core goal of, of designing these types of tools, and the, the, because they're, we're, I'm working with professionals, they're, they, what they have, the needs they have for their tools are much greater, right? It's sort of an extreme case. They're going to be using these tools for eight hours a day, probably every day of the week. And so the ultimate goal as a tool designer is to get people into this state of flow. And the idea of flow is something we talk about quite a bit. Um, I think we've probably all experienced some sort of state of flow, and there's been a lot of research into this topic recently. And essentially, flow is this state of optimal experience where you become extremely focused on the task that's at hand, and everything else seems to just fade away. Time seems to distort, and you enter this time where you're at your peak performance. Um, so this is what we strive for as tool designers, to enable for our users. And there are two main requirements in order to make that happen. There needs to be a really high level of skill from the user, and there needs to be a high level of challenge. And those two need to be in balance, and they both need, need to be at very high levels to reach a deep flow state. If you imagine a juggler, if you gave me three balls and told me to juggle, I'm going to get pretty frustrated because I cannot juggle at all. But if you brought a, pr a professional juggler up on stage and you told them to juggle three balls, they're going to do a pretty good job, but they're eventually going to get bored because the challenge is too low for them. Now, if you give them some chainsaws, and they're juggling chainsaws, Chances are they're going to focus a little more intently because the challenge is more in line with their skill level. And so that's what it's really about, is making sure that our users have the skills they need to take on bigger and bigger challenges. So that gives us a framework for designing tools. This thing doesn't seem to want to work if I go too far away. So there are a few principles that I'd like to propose for designing tools for, for this flow state.
And the first is to set a bias. Like, you're never going to get away from the fact that there will be a standard distribution of skill across your entire set of users. You will have people who are beginners who are just onboarding, or maybe they haven't quite taken that skill to the next level and become this intermediate. Uh, but the intermediates are where most of your users are going to be sitting. Um, and ideally, everyone becomes a professional, but that's just not realistic. Not everyone will always get there. So it is best if you, you just understand that that is the nature of it, and you design specifically for intermediate users. This can be a little counterintuitive, especially when we start talking about user testing, right? If you put things in front of somebody who is uh, fresh to the tool, they're going to give you sometimes some false negatives uh, as to what they really need from this. So, some of the techniques. This, bo this bias boils down to everything that you design inside of the interface, including the words and images and colors, and every single design choice needs to be tailored towards that, that bias. Um, I want to do a, a quick little experiment to kind of explain how words and images and, and colors can be used for different skill levels. Like, everybody to just look at this eyeball. I'm going to flash an image, and I just want you to see if you know what it is. Latency in the slides. <laughs> it's killing me. <laughs> I, just, I just blew it. I really don't know why this is doing this to me. It was Tim the Toolman Taylor, right? Chances are you would have gotten that. Um, and that's because our brains are hardwired to recognize faces like very, very quickly. Um, and if you're anything like me, this brought about a lot of other emotions and feelings, maybe some nostalgia. Um, and so images, when we use those inside of an interface, are, are incredibly powerful. Let's take a look at a couple other examples. Let's stare at this eyeball. Hopefully it works. Okay, so that was an icon. You probably understood what that was. You could probably tell that it was a lightning bolt. You may not understand what that means in context of if I put this inside of a tool, right? But you can build meaning inside of icons, right? And, Icons are something that play really well to people who are in the intermediate or advanced skill set because they encapsulate meaning and can be used and recognized really quickly throughout an interface. Beginners will struggle sometimes with icons if they don't have labels that, that go along with them. That was a word, right? Words are slower inside of an interface. They can be very clear and they help beginners a lot, but they're much, much slower. Chances are you understood that that was a word, but you may not understand the word because it's made up. Uh, this is a word that my five-year-old made up. It's a combination of difficult and complicated, in case you were curious. Uh, but the point is, is that words can be very, very clear, but they're much slower. And when you're dealing with professionals who need to flow through an interface, time is really of the essence, and you can be slowing them down by putting too many labels on things, right? It's often better to strip all of that stuff away. One last one. Didn't work. I'm going to skip through this quickly. That was the color red, right? And the point here was that the color, colors are extremely fast, right? Colors can even be uh, interpreted when they're in your peripheral vision. And so color is a really solid way to indicate the status of the application. So that, and it's very, you'll see this pattern a lot, like whatever is selected inside of the application will be blue or some other color. That way you understand exactly what's happening inside of the app without even really glancing at certain pieces of the interface. Words are super clear. They can help define concepts that are difficult to understand, or they appeal really well to people who are beginners. Icons are very efficient in that they can encapsulate ideas in a very small amount of space, and they can be perceived very rapidly. And images are really, really powerful, so use them using sparingly. And of course, design is difficulted. The second principle here is to simplify. Now, now that we've established a bias towards those intermediate users, we still have the job of making it really simple for them and people who are beginners or professionals. We still need to do that. The trouble with simplicity is that applying it in certain areas typically means that somebody else suffers for it. So if you make something really simple for a beginner, chances are professionals are going to pay the price for that. It just seems to work that way. Um, and so some, some concepts to help you really simplify things uh, First is to mimic. Mimic the behaviors that users are already, are, are already exhibiting. And often what this means is go ahead and steal from your predecessors. 
Um, you shouldn't be ashamed to build upon what others have done. You take a look at Photoshop. They introduced layers about uh, version 3. Um, at, at first, it was pretty confusing, but since then, everybody uses a, a layers palette. Why would you even try to reinvent something like layers, right? Everybody understands this concept. And so reusing those patterns allows us to jumpstart people up that skill curve, right? They jump from beginners to intermediates almost immediately. When you're building really complex systems like these tools, um, every time you introduce a new mechanic into the system, you're not just increasing the complexity of that one particular challenge that it's trying to solve, you're really increasing the challenge of the entire tool. So adding new mechanics into a tool can be really expensive for your users. So you have to learn to conserve mechanics. And I think one of the best examples of this is with the iPod, when they introduced the click wheel. Right? There's two mechanics to this. You can spin your thumb on this thing, or you can push the buttons. That's really amazing, because you can use that to seek through tracks, or navigate through menus, or play games, all with those two very simple mechanics. And we see this inside of interfaces as well. Um, if we take a look at Illustrator's palettes, I love Illustrator's palettes, um, but I'm going to use them as a counterpoint here. If you want to set a fill or a stroke inside of Illustrator, you have one way to select the fill, one way to select a different way to select the stroke. You, ha you can change red, green, and blue channels at the top. But if you want to do opacity, that's somewhere else. And so there's a number of different mechanics just to set the same thing, right? If you compare that with Sketch's Inspector, right, you use the same pattern to add a fill, to add a stroke, to add a shadow, to add prototyping now, all using that exact same pattern, right? The same mechanic is making this, the system simpler. And every time they introduce a new feature, those people can onboard to that feature much faster. So it's a really solid pattern to uh, keep things simple across the board. So abstraction is about understanding your user's mental model, the way they think about the content, not necessarily the way that you're creating the content. This is a hard thing for people making tools because you're so in-depth trying to understand the implementation layer of this that it's hard to step back and understand people's mental model of what they think the content actually is. So I'm going to use the best stock photo ever created as part of this example. Um, let's say that I wanted to add a blue bar across this. Maybe I'm going to fill it with some text. That looks terrible, right? That covered up the best part of this, of this image. Um, but if I apply a blend mode to this, I can see, I, now I can start to see through this. Now, the implementation model for this looks like that. That's what multiply equals, right? You can't surface that to people. What about screen? Oh, come on. You can't put that inside of an interface, right? Now, it would, be, it would definitely appeal to professionals. It would make their job, they could, they could wield some real power if they could write functions for blending inside of a tool. But that's too complex, and it's not biased towards those intermediates. So we implement abstractions, right? And we say, hey, let's invent some terms, multiply and screen, that help define those things. That solves problems for everyone across the skill curve. Automation is a really great tool to use for beginners because it helps them overcome difficult challenges, but it also helps advanced users by saving them the monotonous tasks that they may have to encounter. So let's take a, couple look, a look at a couple of these. Here's a beautiful Bob Ross painting. It took him four minutes. <laughs> but when we took a picture of this, it scanned in a little bit dull, right? So we go into Photoshop and we open up curves. If you're unfamiliar with curves, looking at a histogram can be fairly intimidating. What is this line going through the middle? What am I supposed to do with this? Um, but what they implemented is this little auto button that you just hit, and automatically it analyzes the image and says, here's a pretty good guess, right? And what's great about this is that you enable beginners to take on a larger challenge, but you've, you're also teaching them how to use the tool in the process. So it's a really solid pattern to help beginners grow. If we take a look at um, the other side of this, if we look at more advanced users, you can save them a lot of time. So here's, uh, here's a screenshot of Studio. We wanted to enable this animation workflow. We knew people were already setting up artboards, um, but we didn't want them to have to go in and actually manually create keyframes and tell us what elements they should animate, all that kind of stuff. So we automated that process. So we go through, take a look at both of the artboards and say, here's layers that seem to be the same. We're going to automatically create keyframes for those. And then you can go into the animation uh, timeline editor and animate those with a consolidated layer stack. So we saved professionals the, the uh, monotony of having to create all of those keyframes and set up assets and that kind of stuff. 
people are going to be using tools all day long. And so ergonomics starts to become a real concern. Saving people both cognitive and physical strain um, is something that's pretty serious. It also uh, has a huge impact on their productivity. So there's a couple of laws that, that can help us understand how to do this. They're fairly intuitive. One is Fitt's Law, which basically says the time it takes for somebody to move their cursor to another spot is relatively equal to the size and the distance of that element. So something that's far away and small is going to take longer to get there than something that's big and close. That makes sense. The other six laws, which is also very intuitive, which basically says the time it takes to make a choice is relative to the number of options that you have. You put these together, and it tells us that the best possible interface is a big circle with a bunch of stuff around it. Um, so you've got a focal point in the center, and then you've got all of these options around. Nobody wants to use a circle tool. That's ridiculous. Um, but that, that principle holds true. And so that's why most of our tools that we use all every day have one large focal point, a canvas or a document or something. And then all the most important tools are at 12, 3, 6, or 9 o'clock, right? Because they're the closest to that central point where everybody's going to be bringing their mouse back to. Um, ergonomics does not just apply to where you put things on the screen, though. Maybe, I don't know if anyone knows where I'm going with this. The Save for Web dialog is an insanely useful tool inside of Photoshop. Um, it helps you export your assets for, for the web. The keyboard shortcut for Save for Web is Command Option Shift S. Um, <laughs> and this, is this has gained a reputation as being the Save for Web claw. Um, you have to do this all the time as a web designer. Uh, maybe not anymore. I don't know what, what folks are doing inside of Photoshop now. But this was a huge strain on your hand. Um, and so thinking about not only where you're putting things on the screen, but what people are going to be doing with their other hands becomes much more important when you're designing a tool that people are going to be use, using day in and day out. And the last principle I'll leave here with is to be able to adapt. Like We're going to do our best to simplify the experience for everybody across that skill curve, but you still need to be able to adapt to different situations. Um, one of the most common patterns that I think Adobe does like fantastically is to, to make the um, interfaces customizable, right? So here they start you off, they bias, right, towards an intermediate set by giving you their essentials palette inside of Illustrator. But you can change. They have presets, or you can customize this yourself to create any variety of palettes that you need. This allows you, as a beginner, to remove all the stuff that confuses you, or as an advanced user, to set everything up so that you can be in flow and not have to worry about anything else. On the flip side of that, we can also use contextualization. We can use what people give us at the time while they're using the application to tailor the experience based on what they just gave us. The most common pattern here is a selection and then an inspector based on that. One of the best tools probably ever created, DevTools, you can select an element, and it gives you just the pieces that you need that pertain to that particular element. Same is true inside of Sketch, and pretty much every other design app now is moving towards this pattern of giving you contextual controls over what you're doing. It's just really powerful. And finally, progressive disclosure. This is a technique where you introduce challenge as it's needed. As people are going along inside of the application, you introduce new challenges that they can opt into. Um, we're doing this inside of Studio. The, the animation workflow can be a little overwhelming if you're really not even trying to do any sort of animation. So after you set up an interaction between two screens, you can choose, hey, I'm just going to use a preset animation. I don't want to get into all that. And you can simply do a push left or push right, and it'll animate that for you. If you choose, you can hit this motion button, and that opens up a couple of extra options, right? Does that automatic linking that we were talking about? And then it lets you set duration and delay, which is sort of the intermediate settings of, of animation. If you really want, you can hit Edit Timeline here. And that'll take you into this whole mode that allows you to dive in and edit every single layer inside of, this, uh, inside of the, your design here. And you can dive in further and go into properties and all that other kind of stuff. But the point there is that the amount of effort that you put into the tool is commensurate with the output that you get from it. Right? And that's, that's the mark of doing progressive disclosure correctly, is that the more people do, the more clicks that they do, you better perform better for them. And I think progressive disclosure is probably one of the, the best tools that toolmakers have, 
because it really kind of embodies all three of those guiding principles. It allows you to maintain your bias. You can just start with those settings, and it keeps it simple at every step along the way. Uh, it's simple based on the skill level that you've just opted into. And then it's also adaptable. If you want to take on further challenge, you can easily do that. So that, along with all of these other techniques, I think are some really solid ways to build tools that lead people towards that optimal experience of flow, which is ultimately what we're trying to do as tool designers. I want to thank you all for having me. My name is Tom Genitasio. I'm at Atasi on the web, and slides are online at designoftools.com. Thank you. <laughs>